That sounds like Kenny. Yep. Is that what we did on a uh, full motion uh, CD? Yep. That's really cool. No hide away. No. Yeah, Kenny. Kenny is the man. All right, we are live. All right, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. We're in the green room with Jamie Brewer today. And hey, hey, hey. And um, no, no, I want to know. So I'm sorry. Give me a second. People are only seeing me now, they're seeing both of us. Uh, okay. You know, all right. So we are live. And uh, okay. I, I I was concerned that I might want to talk just about me for a few minutes. You know, I have you on to interview you. You know, um, you know, I'm having issues today. <laughs> I have issues. And you know, over the years, um I, I kind of remember sometimes when we would be out on gigs and we would sit and I actually would look forward to talking with you during the breaks because uh, I have issues. <laughs> And I go, As if I don't have any, yeah, right? No, you're good. You know, you're always, you're, you're Jamie, you know? So I would sit yeah. in the chair and, and, uh, you were always, uh, really a good person to have around it and talk to. I appreciate that. So, uh, now that's probably going to be the last thing nice I say about you. <laughs> yeah. I figured probably caused a little pain in your head or something, you know, like, ah, okay. I'll, I'll right. That. all right. So, yeah. um, now, if you if you uh, can get up your Facebook page and and see what I've posted, okay, going up of a bit of a delay, and then you might be able to uh, start a watch party when you see it. Okay, let me see. And um, we actually have a couple of viewers. I have to I actually see. Let's see. While you're doing I have, have no, I see a post saying Jamie Brewer at four four p.m. Uh, re reload your uh, page, and it, we are live. It, there's a bit of a delay, so it might show up in a couple of seconds. Okay, uh, but while you're doing that, I'm I'm putting up next to you a photo that I pulled off of your uh, Facebook page. That <laughs> easy. <laughs> it's a bit it's a picture of you uh, with the Kanzaki Lounge. Do you remember the Kanzaki Lounge days? Oh yeah. And Garth. Oh Weber, yeah. Garth Weber is there, and Frank Martin, and I don't know the other fellows, uh, but you. That's uh, Joel Smith and Tony Lindsay, and Marquino. Is that, is that Tony? Yeah. Wow, man. That, yeah. I, that's a pretty good band, you know. They just some. Oh man, that was that was like my weather report, as far <laughs> as I was concerned. I mean, that was an amazing experience. You know, there were there were uh, that Kanzaki Lounge gig, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and Frank would be the guy to ask because it was his gig. Yeah, that went on for Thursdays. I think it was Thursdays, was Tuesdays, it? Tuesdays, and it went on for quite a while. Is that right? Yes, yes, and that was that wonderful. Was slamming. Oh man, man. So, um, now, uh, I also have a picture of you. This is this is the 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 Jamie that I know, right? Mm -hmm. and this is the picture of you, and I believe it's with the whispers. Okay, and because you're all in white with your orange base, and, yeah, uh, and you know maybe see if your Facebook page has loaded it up yet, and um, uh, and then if it has, cool. If not, we'll just keep on going because what I want to know is um, you've always sort of teased me about being from Nebraska. Ding 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 ding. But, it, you know, you were actually 
you grew up in a rural area. Is that not correct? Or was it a city in Kentucky? Where'd you Louisville, go? Kentucky. And uh, there's no, there was no industry there at that time. Um, there were, though, a few groups that had came from Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, actually, no, let me correct. Yeah, there was Wildflower, the group that made Wildflower, um, that 70s ballad. Uh, she ran calling wild. No, 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 no. That's the Nebraska version. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, I, I, I hate that I can't uh, remember who, because uh, it was a ballad. Oh my God, I can't believe it. It'll come to me later. Uh, but Midnight Star had a couple of members from Louisville. Okay. Uh, Belinda Lisp Lipscomb, uh, the female singer uh, in that band. And then there was uh, uh, Prince Philip Mitchell, who was a popular songwriter uh, from that area uh, at the time. And uh, pretty much it there was probably some other groups but those are the only ones i really knew of now um, at the time you but you told a story about seeing uh verdine white yeah yeah and that's what got you into bass it, were you in in louisville at the time no no i was living in boston massachusetts at that time um what had happened was I lived in Louisville, Kentucky until I think around the age of seven. Then we moved to Boston for some reason up until the age of 15, then back to Louisville again. So um, I really didn't start playing bass until uh, I was 15 right before I moved to Louisville, Kentucky. So you started playing bass when you were in Boston. Yeah. And then you kind of took that to Louisville and just started studying in Louisville. Were there, were there teachers there? Were there outlets there? No, I never took one lesson. Um, what had happened was, to, just to tell the story, um, you know, my mother was very religious, you know, so we, we were just listening to, to Christian music, um, pretty much. So if we heard any R and B, it was probably from the neighbors. Uh, and, you know, I started to hear every now and then I would hear some Diana Ross and, you know, some, some other stuff, some stylistics, you know, over the, somebody else's radio, you know, or. Or something I said, man, I really like that stuff, you know. Um, it actually, I've got to say that it probably turned me off a little bit to, you know, gospel music because I that's all I heard day and night, day and night, you know. Um, <clears throat> and then I went to, uh, um, I went to live with my uncle uh, for you know a short time when I was fifteen. And he had uh, a turntable that you could stack like 10, like 10 to 15 albums on at that time. And you just, they would just play automatically. And he would just, you know, he would just let that play all day long. He would stack 15, 20 albums and just one by one. And you couldn't touch his, he loved his stereo system. So, hmm you would not, you'd get a beat down. So, you know, he let that play day and night. And I was like, oh my God, this music is unbelievable. I mean, I got to hear the B sides of everything and, you know, the full album, it got so, it got to the point where I could literally hum the whole albums, the whole album in my head. I knew it was coming up, you know, and then, one day I opened up the Gratitude album mm. and I saw Verdine with his white bass. And just by looking at, at his picture, I said, that's what I want to do. 
And I had never picked up a bass at that time. I had never, you know, I just saw that he was playing. Uh, there was Al McKay was also in that album cover and his guitar had six strings, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> and then Verdine had four. So I was like, okay, I like his guitar. I didn't even know what they called it. <laughs> <laughs> I just know one had four and one had six. And that's pretty funny because one day when I went to buy my first guitar, I thought it was a bass, but it was actually a lead guitar because it had six strings. So I didn't even know, you know, <laughs> but I know. Right. So I, I see Verdine and I'm like, man, that's what I want to do. I didn't even know what he was doing. I just felt like that he was doing something because the strings look fatter and I said this must be the low sounding guitar that he has and I was like okay but how am I gonna get a guitar and you know then I looked up on my uncle's wall and he had a bass guitar and a, a lead guitar hanging on the wall just for decoration and so I asked him if I could play it one day and he said, nope, don't touch my stuff. Don't touch my stuff. It's up on the wall, right? <laughs> <laughs> so do you think I did it? No. Next day he went to work, that four string thing came down off the wall and I started playing uh, along with, with just using my ear. I would put my chin up because there was no amp. I put my chin up on the edge of the bass and that amplified it. I'd have it on my knee in between my knee and my chin. And I started playing, uh, you know, I want to thank you, you know, this little groove that was on that album, you know, and man, when I first realized I was actually duplicating that, I was hooked, mm. hooked, hooked. So what I did was I would time when my uncle was gone to work and I would play it all day long after school until he got back, you know, and knew when he was getting back and put it back up on the wall. He never knew. <laughs> he never knew. And you know, what's amazing about that, Jeff, is that that's how I learned a lot of songs subconsciously before I could even play the bass is because he let the turntables play and you know you're talking t-sop tower power uh mm -hmm. you know bt express you're talking about sister sledge all those songs we played mm -hmm. i knew them based on memory but i hadn't applied them to the bass yet so it was as if i learned the songs so well in my head that i just applied it to the bass you know so when when did you uh, get your first bass and get out of uh, Louisville? I mean, how? Well, well, what happened was I went from we we went from um, Boston to Louisville, and my very first friend that I met lived right across the street. His name was Jeff. Uh, ironically, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and so. You know, me and Jeff hung out and you went to my house after school. So I came over to his house after school and we were sitting there uh, listening to music and I of his of his uh, basement. And I said, oh, my God, is that a bass guitar? He said, yeah, but I don't play it. I was like, man, would you sell that to me? This was like the first day I moved to. You know, I, after I enrolled in school and he said, yeah, yeah, I'll just give me 25 bucks. And I ran home and said, mom, please, 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 please. And, you know, she didn't have it, but she gave it to me and I'll never forget it. And I was in heaven. It was a K four string bass. And I brought it home <clears throat> and I started playing. And I never, I never uh, looked back after that. I just started playing. Not one lesson. I just learned everything by books um, and listening. That's how I learned. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, uh, 
when you you were learning that what what was your first band experience wow okay so my first band experience was when i started playing bass i went down to to hang out with a couple friends to play some sports uh we were playing we're about to play some football some tag football this was you know and i heard all this music coming down from the basement i didn't realize my new friends were all musicians so they were playing music they were playing one one guy was playing drums another guitar another bass and one played keys and they were just jamming around and i was like oh, this is incredible and so i asked if i could sit in and they were pretty much blown away because they were like how long have you been playing i said three months they were like nah get out of here <laughs> you know and because I knew everything, you know, I had started, I was serious about it and I learned all the songs that they were playing and I learned them note for note, you know, and um, they were like, man, you know, so we had a band, we would do, we'd do band after school after that. And then one thing led to the, to the, to the other. And I started playing in the public parks with, you know, the local bands and oh man i loved it fell fell in love with it never never once did i consider that you could make money from this <laughs> never it wasn't until i was about 17 18 you know when i realized i can make some money doing this and uh next thing you know i was i was getting a reputation around around town and some of the you know the big you know, big time jazz guys, uh, smooth jazz. At that time, it was really smooth jazz. You know, I mean, smooth jazz today is like a watered down version of the smooth. Like back then, Grover Washington. Right, right, right. You know, with Grover Washington and a lot of groups you don't even hear. Uh, Caldera and, you know, there was a lot of like, you know, kind of fusion -y type bands, instrumental. And those were big at that time. And I was playing a lot of that stuff. And so a lot of the older musicians were picking me up. And I was like usually the youngest guy in the band, you know, playing with these, you know, these cats that have been playing for a while. But it's because I had studied so well, you know, just for fun, I didn't realize I was more advanced than, you know, a lot of the local guys. Well, you know, I think uh, you were learning the, the tunes and how to play and feel the tunes uh, as opposed to just studying the bass and not knowing the tunes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So yeah. There may be kids that were taking lessons and studying the bass, but not knowing the tunes. And yes. It, <clears throat> from my perspective, when you when an old a group of old guys are sitting there playing, they don't want somebody to come sit in and yeah, I know how to play this. Well, do you know the tune? Right. And right. No, well, how's it go? But right. you step up and you play and you know the tune. Yes. It's a whole different story. Well, you know, that's a whole uh, that's a whole another subject right there and it's like knowing the tune is 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 respecting the tune, you know. And a lot of musicians just play and they say, yeah, it goes something like this. And it and it's not just anything, you know, somebody took their time to learn. And, you know, like for instance, Brick House. Right. You know, I mean, if you really listen to it, he put intention behind the way he played that, that, that bass line. So you just can't play what you want and say it's just this because it's disrespecting the tune. And, and somebody who really knows the tune will say, you know what, you're missing a note or you added too many notes or whatever. You know, it's part of the structure of the song. So, you know, a lot of people don't know, a lot of musicians, uh, I would say bass players that I grew up uh, around in the Bay Area, I'm just gonna say it, you know, you, they didn't really listen you know, there was very, a handful of them that really listened to how the tune is being played and the technique mm. that was applied to it. You know, if it was a finger tune, why are you playing it with your thumb? You know, um, if why are you playing with your fingers if it was a muted technique? You know, I mean, so those are the things that were important to me, which was 
duplicating the song exactly how I felt like, you know, the the bass player before me was doing. Tr trying to, uh, there are two things that I thought about while you were talking. One was at the Mark Hopkins one time, I sent a drummer and I showed up and I sent him a couple of times and I showed up halfway through one night and he had, he literally had one groove for every song. <laughs> it, was, See. See. Like, it was like a rock, a rock groove. Every song was boom, jack, boom, jack. <laughs> either in, either either in triplets or 16th or eighths. Oh my God. And see that, that just takes away from, from the integrity of the song, you know, right? and the, in the style, you know, it just takes away from, you know, what it's supposed to be. And that really affects, it, it goes, you know, you, you've got the audience out there listening and they may not be able to tell you exactly what you're not doing, but they know something's quite not sounding right. Right, right, you right. Know? They they know this. Uh, one, one other thing that that came up too, uh, and then I want to let let you. I want to find out about how you got to the Bay Area. But one time I was trying to learn a samba, and I was taking lessons from this guy, uh, Rick Hansen, down in Campbell, mm -hmm. he was sitting and playing a samba. And he said to me, "Okay, so this is these are the notes and how it plays. And this is you. Anybody can play that, but in order to play it right." and make it feel you got to get into the head of the guy in in sitting in brazil playing this samba what's he thinking what's he feeling what goes into making him play this this groove you know what kind of pain has he had what you know get into that mindset of why that feels that way and then you'll start to maybe play how it feels mm -hmm. you can't just sit anybody can play the notes you know kadunk, 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 but yeah there's a whole feel to it so so that's what you were learning when you were studying those records is you were going on how it felt and playing that along with them yeah more yeah. learning the 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 notes yeah and and just to add to what he was saying i mean there's just so much you can do i you know i i totally understand what he's saying but one of the things about when you hear Latin music, you know, when you hear, you know, music is the culture of it has to come through that music as well. You know, I mean, as much as I would love to play, you know, in a, a Latin band full of Latin, you know, Latino musicians or, you know, uh, from the islands, I can't feel it the way they're feeling it. You know, they, they, they eat, breathe and drink. Right. that right. you know um you notice that when you become a teacher in music too you know um there's a there's a certain way that we all feel based on our culture you know where we come from no matter what somebody tells you to say or tells you or shows you how to do it you're still going to do what you feel right right and you know uh, a lot of what you've just shared about your your background in history from your your really strict religious upbringing with your mom and yeah. her learning to play bass and what you just described really adds some background is when we're having our triple J talks and we're talking mm -hmm. about, you know, religion and, and all those sort of things, I'm getting a clearer understanding of where you're coming from. Yeah. And, and what yeah. your upbringing was like and which was completely different than mine, you know, uh, yeah. I, I have to say my, my country feel based on where I was at a way lot different than your country feel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You could see that. that's definitely true. As, definitely true. As a matter of fact, um, uh, and people in Nebraska might not necessarily agree with this, but there is no feel in Nebraska. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's, there's no <laughs> feel for music. <laughs> there there are some great musicians, however, that did come out of Nebraska. You know, there was a guitar, yeah. Player, yeah. guitar player, Billy Rogers, that played at the Crusaders for a while. Was man, yeah, that dude. I, I yeah, mean, you know. So, but the thing is, is is there there was no really cultural music in Nebraska, which is basically what I'm trying to say. There was no real, yeah, like yeah, like, what you were describing in Kentucky though, and is yeah. that 
where you grew up was that a bit sort of in the south or not really it's more midwest what where no were yeah it's well i would say more midwest mm -hmm. it is with 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 southern uh enhancements or coloring or you know um I forget what they call it, but anyway, yeah, you might as well. So there's some parts of Kentucky might as well be the South, mm. you know. Um, but you know, I I have to say that um, you know a lot of my grounding came from from playing throughout Kentucky. I played with a band, uh, you know. I had played all the lo with all the local soul, R and B, and pop, and you know. Uh, a lot of the artists who came in town, I got to play with a few, you know, I mean, it was amazing. I got to play with a few artists who, who were, were popular uh, at the time. And, uh, but, um, you know, when uh, I happened to join up with quote unquote, the white band of Louisville, Kentucky, <laughs> That's when things took off. <laughs> oh my God. Let me tell you something. That was an experience. I was the first black guy in an all white band um, at that time. That was the 80s, early 80s, I want to say. We, there was a, a famous uh, tr uh, uh, booking company called Triangle Talent. And, um, you know, they booked all the, I mean, at that time, there was a lot of clubs that had music six to seven nights a week. And you could literally go on a circuit, you, you know, uh, a lot of the bands would buy a big truck and we would go and every, you know, there was like this, oh, my favorite, Brass A Saloon. They were like in <laughs> Indiana and you know, Kentucky, Cincinnati, you know, just kind of like on the outskirts, probably four hours drive, you know, but you could work six nights a week easily. And we did, we worked six nights a week. Uh, we worked, um, we had, uh, and the hours were like 10 to three in the morning. We didn't care. Yeah. We loved it. We absolutely loved it. You know, every now and then it was a nine to one, but you know, sometimes it was like, you know, fell it absolutely loved that. I mean, that was, man, I had so much fun. And let me tell you something, Jeff, I have to say, being the first black guy, um, I think I played with the Blitz kids, maybe a, a little bit over a year, year and a half, something like that. We were the number one band at the time in the circuit in Louisville, Kentucky. There was another band called The Score. And then there was a local band that had their own clubs called the City Lights. But as far as playing in a circuit, we were the, uh, the number one band. We actually played on TV a couple times. And um, we had great, you know, uh, players in our group. Um, and we did all the rock hits i mean zeppelin to um i mean you name it um uh, to def leopard to you know i mean here's this black guy i've always played r b so this was new for me too so i was like man i could play this stuff this is easy <laughs> but when i got into rock band to the rock band i tried to bring an r b approach to it that's not what you, that's a no no right <laughs> <laughs> no you got to do those driving eighth notes dude right. you know you got to rock out you know no fills no plucks no thumbing none of, none of that you become really a rock bass player and so i fell in love with playing you know rock at that time as well you know we was doing rat and you know just all kinds of great stuff at that time. Uh, ZZ Top was my favorite at that time, you know, uh, because that was just a, you're talking about pure hardcore rock. That was the truth back then. Play one ZZ Top song and you were everybody's best friend, you know, <laughs> you know, I mean, the worst comp, the worst. And, and, and here's the thing about that, Jeff. I played six nights a week for over a year, maybe a year and a half. 
and not once did I was I disrespected. Mm. Did I feel threatened? Did anybody come up to me and you know disrespect me? Once I got on stage, it was a wrap. You want to know what the worst compliment? I mean, the worst thing I ever heard. Tell me these these bunch of <laughs> these biker dudes. They were so cool. They were so cool. I went to the bar and I got something to drink and this big, you know, ZZ top kind of biker guys and his boys were there. You know, they was like, hey, come over here and join us for a drink. And then I go over there. Right. And they say, you know what? You're all right for a colored guy. Ah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they were my best buddies forever after that they were buying me drinks uh i wasn't drinking but you know i was take have like virgin pina coladas with them just to socialize and stuff but every time we did that circuit they would be there and they were my fans you know they were like i mean it was just great man i had some good experiences not once did i hear the n-word not once nice well but you know, the, looking back, you know, you, I remember when my parents uh, said something about, and this is in recent days, uh, said something about colored. You know, there yeah. was a time there, there there was a time when saying colored was disrespectful. It still is. It was still, but back then it yeah. was like, whew. And uh, the other thing I wanted to kind of uh, get to, you know. Uh, there was a time when people wanted to get in a band and do those six nights a week so they can get tight and get good as a band. Yeah, man. And there were, there was a time when everybody could work like that, man, every night. I loved it. And, and, and you know, you, the, the pay wasn't great. I think uh, if I remember the, the kind of money I was getting, maybe, maybe two or 300 a week, I was getting 500 a week and loving it. Wow. And, and we had band houses, so we didn't really have to do anything. But, you know, we didn't have any hotel rooms, you know. Um, we just, you know, bought our food during the week and it's 500 bucks a week. You know, and if it was um, if it was closer to the holidays, like New Year's Eve, then it was more, you know. Uh, but I didn't even care. I was loving my life. I was like, I could do this forever forever that's i mean i was living my dream dude i mean you're talking about a guy who said he was going to become this and he's doing it now mm -hmm. you know but what happened was we peaked we became the number one band in the area and i said hey guys what if we do a cd and there was all like cd <laughs> why would we do a, a record right. you know i think they were still doing albums at that time yeah they were like they were loving it because, you know, it's like we really didn't. Everybody was making, you know, back then, five hundred dollars a week with no expenses. Everybody was was pretty much fine, you know, with with that, you know, and um, and and that's when I decided to move to California. And and what? Why did you did you pick the Bay Area on intentionally? Uh, well, happened. The, the the my girlfriend at the time had cousins who lived in the in the bay area hmm. and no santa cruz that aptos area yeah and and she said you know what my um my my uncle said we could we could live with them for you know temporarily until you know we got on our feet if you want dude i put in my notice <laughs> <laughs> okay like within three weeks with the band, they were bummed. They were bummed. And uh, I said, guys, I, I just want to do something else. We've peaked. We've, we're, we're the number one, you know, party band in this area. There's nowhere else for us to go. I want more than this. And they didn't. I would have probably stayed if uh, we would have went and started recording because we had some great pl players. You know, we one of our guys got, I think he, he got called to audition with Def Leppard 
at the time because he had the whole look and the and the sound and the tone and the big blonde hair, you know. You know, I wanted to ask you about that. What what kind of a were, were you wearing uh, some like skin tight pants then, my friend? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I actually have pictures, but uh, oh, I want to see them. Oh my God, I'll send them to you. Okay, but I actually have pictures of me uh, wearing the rock gear. Oh, yeah. see, I, I wish I would have had them to show right now. Yeah, and the long hair, you know, I had a big, long uh, mullet, you know, and it was, uh, it, was uh, it, it was something to see. So I'll send them to you. Um, but, man, I'm telling you, dude, we had some, those were some wonderful experiences. But I had to, I moved, I made that decision to move to the Bay. And when I moved to the Bay, I only had 750 bucks and a bass guitar. That was it. Wow. And as soon as I got to the Bay, um, I went and sat. I went and sat in. I found out what, what club I could go and sit in at. And on Thursdays, there was a place in Santa Cruz uh, where they had, like, jam nights. And I went there one night with just my bass. The first night I got there, the first Thursday that came up, and this guy, Bill Hopkins, <laughs> was there. And Bill came up to me. I'll never forget it. He came to me and said, hey, man, do you play in a band? I just sat in on a song. And I said, no. And he said, I got a band. You want to play? And I said, yeah. And I said, but I don't have an amp. He said, that's fine. I'll buy you one. And so, yeah, Bill Hopkins bought me an amp. And I paid it off through the gig. And I played with him for a while until I ran into a band called uh, Another Musician. Um, by the name of Joe Gershon, and he there was a band called Rush Hour, mm. uh, and they all they did was David Sanborn and you know stuff like that. Uh, Doug Rowan on sax, Bill, um, what is Bill's? Oh man, I can't believe I can't remember Bill's last name right now. He plays guitar in the in the in the San Francisco. Bill Shray? No, uh, man, I can't believe it. Bill Burgess, Bill no Hampton. black guy, Bill Hampton, Bill Hampton. So it was me, Bill Hampton, Joe Gershon, Doug Rowan, and Ruben Valtier. Ru Ruben is playing with Weird Al Yankovic now, hmm. uh, but the bass player Larry Antonino he went on to play with Ronnie Laws, yeah. and he left at the last minute. So I, Joe Gershon, come, calls me out of the blue and says, "Man, I heard about you. Can you learn?" these songs we got a gig at the crow's nest in santa cruz and i'm like sure when's the gig he said tomorrow night <laughs> i had to learn 40 fusion tunes at least 40 fusion tunes overnight you know what i take that back the gig was that following sunday and because that's when rush hour played and we rehearsed on a tuesday so so what i did was it, it was audition time on that tuesday so i learned all the songs note for note let it play over and over that's how i learned songs i just let them marinate in me like my uncle did mm -hmm. he just let the record play over and over and over and over again and i concentrate on the bass part so when i got to the audition with rush hour after the first song, they said, wow, he even learned the mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> that, I didn't even know there were mistakes in the songs. I just learned. I felt like it was a <clears throat> I heard it with different ears. Yeah. So to me, it was music that was part of the song. Um, and but, you know, I, I, you know, Bill Hampton had said, it and I said, wow, you know what? Now I see, because now I hear the actual recording of the song, and I'm like, wait a minute, where's that part at? So I learned that, and the rest was history. Rush Hour played every Sunday fusion, danceable fusion music, and we packed it every Sunday. In Santa Cruz at the Crow's Nest. Oh, man, that place was amazing, dude. Wow. Amazing. And I can't believe, so is that, is that where you met uh, Will Russ? No, I didn't. Will Russ wasn't even around at that time. Oh, but you so but you played with Bill Hopkins and and uh, and uh, Rush Hour. And uh, so when when was that? Like the early, late 80s, early 90s? 80s. 
eighties, uh, late, late eighties. And then, you know, again, peaked, I felt like I peaked in Santa Cruz cause I was teaching. And back, back then you could play five nights a week at the local clubs. So I was playing at like three different clubs during the week, plus teaching during the day. And I got complacent. I was like, I remember having coffee in Capitola at this cool coffee house, like right on the Esplanade. Mm -hmm. I went to the back and I was looking at the ocean and I'm like, I'm way too comfortable here. And so I met some musicians from Oakland uh, California. And I had an opportunity to play with a fusion band over there. And then that led to more connections in Oakland. And then I went and heard Spangalang and that was, it was a wrap. <laughs> was my, was Myron playing? Myron, Myron was playing bass. They were killing it. And I was like, this is the band I want to play in this. So I ended up doing a lot of subbing for Myron because Myron was going to uh, was doing stuff with Santana and a lot of recording and, you know, stuff like that. Right. So it was, you know, me, Dave Jones and uh, were like Myron subs. And uh, Peter Boris was playing drums, right? Peter Boris was playing drums. Yeah. Band. Man, that band was, you know, I learned a lot playing with Spangalang because for Spangalang wasn't locked down into the structure you would learn the structure of the song first but then you would create your own groove and pocket from the structure so every night was a learning experience and uh tom was in that band for while you were was tom in that band while tom Pallister you... was playing uh yeah he was playing at the time every now and then the john arbor would play on keys and um you know always a lot of guests on keys a lot of different guys on keys. John Seppala played one night, I remember. Um, um, but Frank even played a couple times, Frank Martin. Mm -hmm. But as far as, you know, the the band, the band in the area, Spangalang was killing it, dude. Yeah. They were, they were just monsters. Monst I mean, you could dance on, they'd play one song for a half an hour, you know. <laughs> Right. With you have five different sections, you know, and it was all improv, you know. Yeah. I mean, you play the song, and then by the time it was like, man, this is just killing. So that was the musicians' fun band, you know. Um, I mean, but you know, you had to play. We were just gonna play with Spangalang. So uh, now, now we're getting close to the time when when you met me. So. Um... You know, Nelson described the day he met me as he put a big black X on his calendar. <laughs> and then he said nothing else. So, <laughs> I'm, going, I'm going, well, I could take that two ways. <laughs> well, well, what had happened is funny because Nelson couldn't make a gig. Yeah. And Nelson, I think, what had been telling you about me. And at that time, I was playing with everybody. I mean, at that time, you could play with 10 bands. Right, right. You, know, Just, what, uh, you were playing with, with a band, and I don't remember what it was, but it was one of those corporate bands. And I remember your first gig. I, I swear this was your first gig at the Yerba Buena Gardens. That was it. And and we were playing for uh, the Smewin Ballet, one of their... yeah. I we the band did their gala for I don't know maybe ten years. Yeah, and and that was your first gig. And all I, I remember the guys that were the 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 real music guys. Were like, yeah, he didn't really know all the tunes, but all I could say yeah. was, but it felt great. Even yeah, though I know the tune. <laughs> well, I've I've never pretended to be a jazz guy, you know. Right. Uh, matter of fact, I was introduced to to jazz you know um and playing it the right way with the you know when i the black market jazz band and you know uh your other you know trios you know it, it taught me to listen differently to the you know the standards and things you just can't you know a lot of the standards i learned were just like people saying hey this is what it is you know here's the core chart but when you listen to 
to the originals, you're like, man, that sounds nothing like what I'm doing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so it's like, and then you, and then, you know, you get respect. You start learning respectfully what the song is, you know? So the, th the, the thing was, is that they were right. I needed to learn the songs, how they were, you know, know them, you know? And then eventually over time, then, you know, I could play them, you know, to the point where they were recognizable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, let, let me, you, you know, here's the one thing that I have to ad admit the, uh, the, some of the gigs we did were, were uh, not your traditional kind of gig in which you could just play songs. You really had to expand your knowledge and depth of music and actually know songs. Yeah to really learn tunes and you couldn't just fake them. You had to know the tunes and you had to know them. And, and I was challenged that way too. Um, I, 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 Scott Morris was teaching in, in Redwood city and he set up this thing where he'd have Don Haas and, um, Oh, Phil Grenadier, not F Phil was Phil, the trumpet player, Larry, Larry was the bass player, I believe. Right. Yeah, but the Don Haas piano player and Larry, and then what they would do is they'd have a, a class where all the drummers would sit and play with them. Yeah, and they were trying to teach us forms of tunes, and so they would say, Okay, we're going to play, um, uh, you know, uh, Love is Here to Stay, for example, just to, just yeah. nothing that simple, but they would play it, and then they'd say, Okay, you take yeah. a chorus, and then yeah. you play a chorus, and they and if I didn't come out just right they'd say, you don't know the tune because you have to sing the tune. In your right. Tune. They start right. teaching me as a drummer. You can't just, you got to learn the tune. You got to learn how it goes. When somebody says yeah. verse and a chorus, well, what is the verse and the chorus? Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, um, so I, I have to say from, from that band too, based on the gigs that we did, we, we had yeah. to learn way more things than normal. Right. <laughs> Right. Right. I, I wish I had had, you know, I knew a lot of R&B and funk, you know, that was my forte stuff, but I didn't know. I knew about jazz, but I didn't know about the standards. You know, I just knew them, how people allowed me to to play them just to get through the gig. But when I went and listened to the stuff, I was like, man, there's a method to this. <laughs> there's a method. There's a method to walking bass lines. You know, there's, a, there's, you know, there's two steps and there's muted. Uh, there's, I mean, there's just all this stuff. So it forced me to, to, to listen in a different way, you know, and blues is the same way. It's not just, you know, one, four, fives. There's different types of shuffles. Oh, you know, I can't, you know, can play blues. You know, there's so, you're right. There's so many different blues grooves. Yeah, there I, is. I could. I know one. I know. Yeah. I could. Yeah. I couldn't play at the blues band. Well, you know, I was introduced to the blues through Pat Ford, Robin Ford's brother, because I played. Uh, uh, that was my very first band to play overseas with. Was the a uh, Robin? Uh, I mean, a uh, Pat Ford blues band. So I really learned, you know, to to listen. And, and play and play uh, blues reluctantly <laughs> <laughs> because I was still an R&B guy, but I did learn a lot about the blues during that time. And then, you know, Dwayne Pate came in after me, but, you know, I learned a, a lot about blues because Pat Ford loved and breathed the blues. So he knew, you know, about swinging and shuffles and that kind of stuff. So, right. you know, when you really listen and you pay attention, you can hear the differences, you know? Right. But you know, I knew that I was, you know, destined for other stuff. So, you know, blues is okay, but it wasn't the thing I was wanting to play forever. You know? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, after, after that, and you met me, um, you were, you were kind of stuck in a rut. <laughs> that was killing me. <laughs> you I was getting killed on a weekly basis at that time. You were you were stuck in a rut with with oh me. my god oh. trio on Tuesday black market jazz on Thursday uh uh 
what is it? Top of the mark on Sat on Friday and Saturday, dude. Oh yeah, we were working. Yeah, it it was, and then full motion. Yeah, I yeah. mean, it there was something you had a band for everything. You know, I remember us playing for like some lawyers uh, settlement conference. <laughs> <laughs> We we did a lot of gigs. That is, yeah. I mean, back then there were gigs happening out the woodwork, you know. But I was also, you know, I had time to play with a lot of artists who would come in town. Frank Martin helped me, you know, with some of that stuff. And you know, then I had my Oakland hookup, where you know I was able to play with a lot of great artists too. You know, Lettucey. You know, let, let, I mean, uh, oh my God, uh, that was heaven. What 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 about Tony Tony Tony? Did you do some stuff with those guys? No, no. But a lot of guys in the groups I did. I did. There was a a a, a hip hop uh, jazz band called Jay Spencer. Oh, and right. a lot of the guys from Tony Tony played with Jay Spencer's band, and I happened to be the bass player at that time, and that was an incredible experience because I got to play with, you know, two of the guys I looked up to was Joel Smith. Um, who played drums and bass, and Carl Wheeler. Uh, when I was in Louisville, Kentucky, um, I used to listen to their gospel album they did with uh, Walter Hawkins, Be, Be Grateful, over and over, because it was kind of R&B and funky. And I said, man, when I get to Oakland, I'm going to meet these guys. Next thing you know, I ended up playing with these guys. And let me tell you something, those those Oakland musicians, oh, man, they have another another thing it's a it's a groove that it, it, it's completely different groove and you can't explain it unless you sit and try to play it. Explain it and you can't be a part of it unless you're unless you've been brought up with it mm -hmm. because a lot of those guys are multi-instrumentalists and 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 then you have the experience of oakland growing up in oakland during that time that also is a part of why they play and how they play you know carl wheeler i believe was playing at, at a TV show when he was like 12 or 13 years old. You know, he's part of a, a regular series TV show. And if you hear some of that stuff he was playing at that age, you're like, oh my God, this guy is a genius. So I got to, 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 to experience a whole nother uh, level of musicianship by playing with Jubu, who was from Tony Tony, and Tony and Carl, Tony, 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 and uh, Joel Smith, who played drums and bass, and he played with everybody, and, um, you know, Jay Spencer. I mean, that, man, that experience, musically, mm. I wouldn't I wouldn't trade it for the world, because they brought something out of you you didn't even know you had in you. Right. One way or the other, they'd bring it out of you. Right. Um, One way or the other. And, and you know that we completely uh, kind of passed over Michelle Schacht. and that's where I met Michelle Schacht over at Carl Wheeler's studio mm. because she was over there doing a session, and Carl Wheeler called me up and said, "Hey man, you want to play on this? You know this lady stuff? You know it's it's real simple." And he called me up and I did the session, and the next thing you know, Michelle asked if we wanted a tour with her at the very end of the session. I was like, okay, well, I don't really know this person, but eight years later. <laughs> right. <laughs> I found out a lot of stuff and more than a lot of that I wanted to know. But man, that experience of playing with Michelle Shock, yeah, I, would, I wouldn't trade it for the world because she introduced me to bluegrass. And some of those bluegrass musicians are amazing mm. and singers and fiddle players. And I mean, people you'll never hear about because they just do festivals like in the summer. And that's where they make the most of their money. Right. And then they go and live back in the mountains somewhere or in their little small hometown somewhere <laughs> and, and work on their instrument and write songs. And then next thing you know, they're doing festivals again and they make all the money they need to selling their CDs at the gig and on the festivals. I'm telling you, dude, it was an experience. You know, tell you ride mm. um, the the Rocky Festival, the Red Mountain. I think it's the Red Mountains in Colorado, and all this incredible stuff, man. Michelle exposed us to along with the emotional challenges as well. 
Mm. Um, <laughs> but man, it was all good. It really was all good. You know, I called Rich. He wanted a horn section, so I called Rich Armstrong, and then you know, they brought in some other guys. You know, Rich brought in some other guys, I believe, for horns. And then next thing you know, I mean, we did so many tours with just, we even did a tour one time with just me, Rich, and Michelle. <laughs> wow. Couldn't believe it. <laughs> Couldn't believe it. And Rich is a multi-instrument, instrument, and, you know, I, you know the word. Yeah, anyway. He's, he's a general. <laughs> he's a beast. He can, he, he can play anything. He was singing and playing, and we were filling up holes where, it was, it, you know, and just dealing with the, you know, the, the, the emotional traumas that went along with it, but enjoying the musical experiences as well. I put you through an emotional trauma too. Yeah, that was killing me too. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, but I remember you sharing some of those stories, and uh, it, it, uh, it it was quite a ride for you doing that gig. Man, talking about, I mean, me and Michelle got uh, really close. I love the woman. Um, she just has some challenges uh emotionally that only she can deal with no one else can i i learned to understand them mm. maybe that's why i'm so good with foster children now you know but you know what uh, I, I know we've we've spent almost an hour talking about all this but we haven't even got to the meat of everything that that you're about now yeah i went to from the whispers 12 years with the whispers and uh, then i got uh, you know the whisper started getting less and less work. And so, you know, one of the things I always loved to, I don't know why was UPS, you know, the trucks, I, being a UPS truck driver was kind of cool to me, you know, <laughs> and I would do UPS. Uh, I was doing UPS and, you know, whenever we had downtime, like in December and January and February, I would go part-time and work for UPS. And then uh, the drivers, a gig came up and I had a mandatory training I had to do and the drivers make great money. Mm -hmm. And I told the whispers, we had a Nokia show during that same uh, week that I got the mandatory training. And um, the whispers said, well, we're going to just let you go. We can't, you know, the Nokia is coming up. And so they decided to let me go. I was pissed. Uh, oh. But uh, yeah, they said that they weren't willing to wait. For me to do that and uh so i went and did it anyway and it's the best decision i ever made because guess who's working and who's not <laughs> you know uh i have it i have to agree with you there <laughs> i'll just leave that right there you know i i, I just gotta say um uh, my experience has been there's been times when when people had have chosen something else other than what i thought was best for me yeah and, um you know in the band but i always have to had to remind myself that that uh other people make choices based on the income they need to make in their career and and that's actually best for them yeah um uh i it's always a if somebody can better their life they need life they need to do that and um yeah uh, and now you're working a lot yeah uh, doing a ups thing but but the thing that fascinated me the most and you know we've already been talking an hour we might have, yeah we might have to do a part two yeah yeah we, we can do a part two because there's a lot we could we could talk about you know um so maybe putting the light on would be a good idea yeah so, um well, you know, well, here, well, here's the thing is, is all the stuff that we talked about was something that I, I never, you and I, for all the years we've known each other, the two mm -hmm. never really sat down and said, you know, yeah, I grew up in Kentucky and I never knew the Verdeen White story. Uh, and yeah, I, I, Verdeen White and I and became good friends. You know, he tucked me under his wing and, you know, every time they came to Louisville, he would uh, get me VIP passes and, um, you know, hung and hung out. And then we didn't see each other for about, probably about 20 years. And then I met up with him in Atlanta and said, hey, I'm the bass player that used to hang out. And he was just blown away. He was blown away. And to this day, you know, right. we can talk whenever we want to talk. But, uh, you know, it's important. You know, he taught me to give back. 
So when I was with the Whispers, I gave tickets to just, you know, passes to strangers sometimes just well, because I deemed it. You never called me. Well, you're not a stranger. You're just strange. <laughs> I'm just strange. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. You know, it's okay to bring a stranger, but we, we don't want this strange dude from Nebraska. At the gig, man. <laughs> but no, I, you know, I, I have to say, no, the, the whispers experience was, was heavenly um, for the most part, because I got to play with seventies. I got to meet and play with some of my childhood heroes, share the stage with people I grew up listening to. Well, uh, let me let me ask you. There was a picture. Was that Gladys Knight that you were with? Yes, but but that's different. How that happened? I make an incredible banana pudding, right? And, right. and these guys had heard about it, but Gladys Knight staff had heard about it, and so they said, "Hey, man, if you make us one of those banana puddings, you, we'll get you in to see Gladys Knight." And and why don't you make one for her while you're at it, man, dude? You know, I, I thought that I drowned, I downloaded that picture to show, but uh, I it's not it's not here. Um, yeah, that's how it happened. And uh, so she called me the banana pudding, the banana pudding man. <laughs> that's why I was grinning like that in the picture. She said, right. "Come here, you my banana pudding man." And so I'm grinning like that in the picture. Yeah, and then uh, I did it. I was able to download this one because I thought this is actually pretty cool. When you're with Larry Braggs and Marcus Miller, Marcus has become a friend. Marcus Miller, you know, Verdine was was my. Um, he's the one who inspired me to be a bass player, but M Marcus Miller is like my mentor. You know, uh, he's really a humble guy. I can call him up and give him crap, you know, and he'll give me crap way back, you know. And, you know, I always tell him, man, make me an orange bass. And he's like, never, you know, he's like, forget it, you know. And then this year, what? He has an orange bass out now. So anyway, but <laughs> Marcus has done great things, man. For, for I mean, when we talk, it's amazing because he says, how are you doing? You know, he's, you know, he's a human being. Right. You know, and Larry Bragg is the one who introduced me to uh, uh, Marcus Miller because Larry was doing some sessions with him and some tours. And he said, hey, man, you know, I was telling Larry, I'm going to go and see you sing, man. He said, oh, yeah, man, I do this thing with Marcus Miller. And I'm like, the Marcus Miller? And I said, man, I got all his stuff and blah, blah, blah. And Larry hooked us up and we've been buddies ever since, you know. And so it's really cool when somebody you can text somebody and they know who you are. You know, I mean, Marcus knows thousands of people, but, you know, I can text him. And he'll say, hey, what's up, Jamie? You know, and he'll remember our last conversation. He's a savant. He's, he's incredible, dude. He, he speaks several languages. He's amazing. Yeah, he's an incredible guy. Um, but, so, you know, uh, so. So the, the whispers, you, you met all these people and that was great. And I sort of followed you through that because I was in my I was in my own hell actually at the time so oh wow yeah i mean you, you and i have brief we really haven't talked about the, the hell i was in. <laughs> oh ouch <laughs> yeah but yeah. but now here's the thing that you and i have talked about after, after the, uh, during the whispers but then after the whispers what you've been doing not only with your ups uh driving but uh, the foster uh, parenting and you and I spoke at length about that. And I think we ought to actually do a whole show about foster kids and foster parenting. And yeah, cause this, I, I it, it deserves that respect. It deserves that attention because through foster foster parenting, I learned a lot about what my kids and what kids miss out on in general you know, when you have a parent that is actually focused on the needs of the child, mm -hmm. you know, when you focus on the needs of a child, it brings out the best in you. Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, a lot of us look at, you know, uh, you know, I've seen parents who, you know, look at their kids like they're just, you know, you know, like the like you would look at look at a necklace or you know an arm piece or 
you know, this attachment, something to make them look good. But man, there are some things that if we paid a little bit more attention that will actually bring out the best in our kids. Wow. Uh, but the key is attention, that it's, it's attention. You know, Michaela, you know, messing around on your knobs when she, you know, on your soundboard when you were, when she was five, as opposed to saying, don't touch that. Right. You know, what foster parenting has taught to me is say, what, what is it you're trying to do? You want to know how that works? You know, right. when, you know, cause you remember, you know, you know, Simone, you know, during that time that was going on in my life when I had my little girl, Simone, you know, she would always want to know what my bass was, you know, and, you know, we would, I would, we would play and sing happy birthday, a little simple cartoon stuff, you know, right. you know, those things really, you know, and Simone used to like to draw as well. So I would just get her paper and not tell her not to draw on this, you know, and she turned out to be an incredible artist, got a four year scholarship in college based on her artwork. Wow. Yeah. And finished school um, a year earlier. Yeah. And uh, yeah, she ended up being, but you know, that's the, that's the thing about that taught me foster parenting taught me is that focus more on the intention uh, 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 that you're giving to the child for the better development of the child, you know, but they, they, it brings, it brings to the front, a larger issue of the uh, hundreds, if not thousands of, of children that have no mentor or have no parent or anybody oh, in a for them or um, trying to help them be themselves. And, and they end up out in society, maybe, you know, robbing and stealing or whatever, because they've never had any kind of uh, uh, help learning skills or having self worth or value. And yeah, you know, it's really, it would be really brutal. I mean, I'm just speaking from, you know, an objective perspective. Um, I have a great friend um, and, you know, Shannon Del Vecchio, and, you know, she's in a, you know, uh, I don't know what you would call, I guess, same sex marriage, you know, I don't know what the technical term is, but they have a daughter and the way she raises or, or teaches that child is the template. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've seen her with this little girl. It's unbelievable. I mean, it's like she is, she allows the little girl to be who she is but she has safe boundaries around whatever choices the little girl makes. Mm. And, and, and it's, it, they have a thing called gentle, gentle parenting that they do. And, and what I noticed is that's missing a lot um, in families, especially in California, because usually it demands two people to work. Mm -hmm. You know, so when you do finally get to see your child, you're like, what do you want? You know, or, <laughs> you know, I got work to do. And you're, in, you know, it's like the child ends up being raised on TV and, you know, snacks, you know, and there's not really a, a parent to give to pay attention to the needs of the child. And the child ends up being raised by TV and their buddies, you know, in the streets or wherever that takes them. Then the next thing you know, there's issues. You're like, how did this happen? And well, it's like no one's giving the attention, direct attention that the child needs at the time. No one's home after school for the homework or the fixing of the lunch or dinner time or, you know, those kind of things matter. You know, so right. those are a lot of things I found out. You know, Well, I think that we ought to do a whole a whole uh, show on on foster parenting and that sort of thing. Yeah, and, and maybe have some some calling because you you wrote a book about it. And, yeah, and I've, was, I've had it up here for a few minutes while you've been talking. Yeah, yeah, It'd be good to do that and promote it and get people to tune in and watch. Yeah, you know it's really interesting because you know I've had some kids read it and they absolutely love it because they're able you know the foster kids are able to relate to Bernie, mm -hmm. you know. And I had, you know, I didn't expect that. I thought it would be more like a parent, 
you know, a foster parent's guide, you know, book to dealing with certain issues you run into. But what I'm finding out is has a children's story kind of quality mm -hmm. for the kids and they're telling me about my own book you know like you know the parts they liked and everything and they remember it you know and i'm like man this is awesome you know so that's just you know that's one of the things i segued into i actually love writing you know i didn't realize i loved it so much and so i made the the book based on my actual experience with that baby bird bernie and how it paralleled with foster parenting you know, in so many ways. Wow. Well, yeah. So let's do this. Let's let we're at an hour and 10 minutes. You know, dude, you and I can talk. <laughs> we can go. <laughs> we're like two old ladies, you know. We're like, <laughs> How you doing, Jeff? What are you going to talk about today? Oh, my God. So um, we'll focus an entire uh, entire show on the foster uh, uh, care system. Yeah. Think is something that I, I never heard people talk about it. I think it would be something to, to talk about. It's really worth talking about because a lot of your foster kids are aging out and working in your fast food places. Yeah, and and they're they're the people that are suffering the most right now. They have no family, no mom, no dad, no cousins, no uncles, no nobody, or even a job. If if they were actually old enough to be working, they aren't working. So imagine. Yeah, no. Forty percent of them are end up homeless. Yeah, very sad. You, you know that, and that could be a lead into another hole. You know, because that that's how we uh, feed our homeless uh, people. That's right? right. We just throw them out, and yeah. Oh. And so, what are you going to do if you're 18, you age out of the foster care system, and you have no life skills? What are you going to get into? You got to survive. Yeah, yeah, and. Uh, I don't know what a lot of foster homes are like the, the child that never gets placed. Yeah. Those kinds of facilities. Yeah. I don't, I I'd like to know some more things about that actually. Oh man. Uh, yeah, get your tissue out. Oh. <laughs> get your tissue out. <sighs> so, so let's do that. Let's plan a, a special thing, but, um, and, and cl close this up the the history about you. Yeah. I, whole different understanding this and you know there, there there are parts of your story that are whole shows yeah 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 the thing about your 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 christian upbringing oh we didn't even get into my whole gospel right. career right we just in atlanta we didn't even get into to my whole experience there i can tell you some really doozies about that <laughs> oh my gosh trust me it's 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 the same madness only in the name of jesus mm. the same game the same issues the same things you hear that happen in the secular world the same thing how does this person look is this the person we want in front you know how well does this person play who knows this person you know oh. uh, we're not gonna pay any i mean dude yeah. That's a whole nother show. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have, we have ammunition now for, for specific shows. Well, let's plan a time to do this. And then that too. Okay. Uh, and uh, I, I'll, we'll see you on Wednesday at six. Sounds good. For the triple J show. Triple J. Yay. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to close it out with uh, a little bit more of this is actually you playing bass on wow. Max Vance. If you remember that with Kenny, yes, uh, and the Tom. great, Kenny, the great Kenny Washington. Yep. All right. Thank you, Jamie. And love you, man. I love you too, man. Here we go. My romance doesn't need a castle rise. To a constantly surprising refrain wide awake I can make my most fantastic dreams come true Woo! My romance doesn't need a thing My romance doesn't need a thing My romance doesn't need a thing Yes, sir But you Yes, sir